Hi, everyone. Good morning. We're just going to give it a few more minutes here to just let the attendees stabilize. Um, we'll get started here in the next couple of minutes. Okay, so we look to be stable here now. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to uh, Douglas Schumacher, who is the LaserNet US chair, for some opening remarks. So, welcome everyone to the LaserNet US Town Hall for the Cycle 5 call for proposals. I am Douglas Schumacher. I'm the new chair of LaserNet US. It's a pleasure to work with LaserNet US's new vice chair, Ming Xing Wei. Our first chair was Jorge Roca and he oversaw the foundation of LaserNet US. Our second chair was Felicia Albert, and she oversaw the dramatic expansion of LaserNet US, but also operation during a very challenging time with the pandemic. But here we are on our fifth call for proposals. What we're going to do on this town hall is that the LaserNet US coordinator, Chandra Curry, is gonna provide an overview of the network. I'll provide an overview of the facilities themselves, but it's important for you to understand and remember that all the POCs, all the facility POCs are here and ready to answer your conversation. So I hope this is the start of a conversation. You can submit questions at any time to us, either by chat or using the Q&A feature. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. Let's get started with uh, uh, Chandra's talk. Chandra Curry is a scientist at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. She is an ex expert in setting short pulse laser plasma driven interactions and the use of the secondary, uh, secondary radiation that you can get from that. She has run experiments all over the world, including at laser net US facilities, uh, such as JLF, NEC, the Texas Petawatt, and the Advanced Beam Laboratory. Most recently, she played a leading role at our successful annual meeting in August 
along with Jorge Roca and the other organizers. This was our first in-person meeting after several years, and I thought it was a big success. She's been an important influence throughout the Laser Net U.S. endeavor. Chandra, why don't you go ahead? Thanks a lot for the introduction, Doug. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, go through today um, and give you um, a little bit of an overview about the what net, what the network is, if this is your first time um, engaging here with us with LaserNet US. Um, and then I'm gonna go through some of the details about this um, current call for proposals for, so for cycle five um, and some information that may help you get started and prepare the best proposal for this, um, for this call. So, there we go. Okay, so LaserNet US um, is a network of 10 high power laser facilities that are uh, distributed geographically across uh, the US and Canada. And, and so the mission of LaserNet US, so we were established back in 2018 um, to advance and promote ultra fast laser science and applications, um, and really to uh, re establish the North American or US um, leadership in this area of research. And so there's a few different things that we want to focus on. So first is driving really, um, really meaningful and high impact science using these high power laser systems and using to them to their full um, and optimal capabilities. Um, but part of our goal is also to uh, create a scientific ecosystem around the use of these lasers. So by providing opportunities to students and early career scientists and giving them access to these uh, facilities and to these uh, broad and diverse laser capabilities to really uh, drive uh, productive and meaningful science uh, projects here. And lastly, to establish collaboration and channels um, and avenues for discussion and collaboration and to really feel these really complex and um, sophisticated experiments that are nationally occur with these facilities. Okay, so who are we? So um, as I mentioned, we are formed in 2018 um, underneath the US Department of Energy Office of Fusion Energy Sciences. Um, and in our last renewal, um, we did, because of our growth um, and the, the things that we were trying to accomplish, we actually adopted a more uh, formal management structure. And so the management branch of LaserNet US consists of um, Douglas Schumacher, who gave the introductory remarks as our chair um, recently. And so this was ch the changeover uh, at the end of our annual meeting this year. Our vice chair is Ming Ching Wei from the University of Rochester at LLE, and myself as the coordinator. And then below that, um, at the next level, we have um, a number of facility uh, committees that represent the different um, kind of branches of the network. And so just to give you a brief overview, um, so first we have the Network Facilities Committee, um, which consists of a representative from each of the 10 facilities, and their responsibility is to hold grants from DOE and, and actually to carry out the awarded experiments. They also play a really important role in implementing the recommendations of our SAB and driving the, um, driving the initiatives of the network. Next, we have, like many of the mid to um, large scale user facilities in various different fields, we also have a user group. And so ours is called the Intense Light Users Engagement Committee. And it's their uh, role to represent the user's interests within the network and to provide recommendations um, on initiatives that would better support the user's needs um, in terms of outreach and opportunities, and even just in operational um, recommendations of the facilities. Next, we have our Diagnostics and Simulations Committees. Um, both of these um, aspects are very, very important um, pieces to designing and fielding um, experiments with these high power laser systems. And so these committees are currently um, assessing the different ways in which we can, LaserNet, we as in LaserNet US can provide support to user groups um, to use these within their, their experimental design and execution. Next, um, we have our proposal review panel. So this is chaired currently by Dr. Ariana Gleason from, from SLAC and Stanford. Um, and she oversees a panel of 20 subject matter experts that span the broad research areas of LaserNet US. And these are confidential members. So we have a, a basically a blind review and their responsibility is to conduct a fair and transparent review of the proposals that are submitted for time um, on our facilities. 
And lastly, we have the Scientific Advisory Board, which provides us with an external perspective and strategic guidance and things like best practices or areas of focus um, scientifically, but also operationally um, moving forward. So we have people from other um, high power laser facilities like Eli, um, also other light sources like um, the advanced light source. So I want to take a minute just to focus a little bit on our intense light users engagement committee, um, just because this is um, a very good resource for users as they prepare their experiments and execute them on our network um, and allows um, the connection between our users. Um, and so this is one of our strongest branches um, to really grow the field and and create that sustainable uh, scientific ecosystem. And so the I use um, is there, as I said, to support the users on the facilities to advocate for the facilities and the user community, um, foster collaboration, but also to promote training and education of students, postdocs, and early career scientists in laser matter interactions. So really looking at the different ways um, that we can support users um, throughout their um, experience with the network. So, um, as I said, the mission of LaserNet US um, can kind of be broken down into three main areas. So the first one is access and networking. And so the LaserNet US network um, consists of, as I said, 10 high power laser facilities, um, which span a very large range of laser parameters, both in terms of pulse duration and pulse energy. So you can see we've got a number of these um, kind of commercial tie sapphire type systems, um, which span a large power range. We've also got some of the ND glass, ND mixed glass systems, um, which have the longer pulse, higher energies. Um, but still kind of in that short pulse regime, as well as our higher uh, high energy long pulse systems like Omega EP, Janus at Livermore, and um, the, the long pulse laser at MEC. And so what's really cool about this is that um, now by providing access to these 10 different facilities with a very large um, parameter space, um, users can really begin to design experiments and field them um, with the laser that best suits their scientific case. Um, previously in our community, um, it was very common um, for you to kind of build your experiment within the constraints of facilities that you had access to, whether you were based at a university and had a, a laser system that was there locally that you could design your experiments for, um, or if you had somewhere that you typically went as your, your team. Um, I know that I personally did my undergraduate research all at, at Livermore. And so the experiments that we proposed and the ideas that we had were really within the constraints of the facilities where we typically had access. Um, but we really wanna remove those barriers um, from high power laser science. And so by doing by having this single open call with access to 10 facilities, we hope to remove that so that the best science can be done with these systems and really span those high impact regimes. Um, so another two pieces are that workforce um, and community growth and science. And so my next couple of slides, I'm just going to go through on how how the how we've been growing as a network and the way that we are driving that science forward. So in the last four years, uh, we have had um, four calls for proposals and we're currently in our fifth cycle. And so what you can see here in the top left um, is in blue, the number of proposals that were submitted to LaserNet US and the number of experiments that were awarded to give you kind of an idea of the, the, the number of experiments that we have per cycle. Um, what's really um, great about the current funding level um, for LaserNet US is that we're able to award a very high percentage of the experiments that are submitted. Um, this is a very uh, good uh, kind of positive outcome for that. Another couple of things that are really great about uh, how um, the kind of the community of people that have been in engaging with LaserNet US is that we've got a really broad distribution of career levels and uh, institutions. And so we have scientists, grad students, postdocs, and even undergraduates, a large number of undergraduates actually in these first four cycles, um, and coming from a very, very large number of unique institutions. So to date, um, as of as of kind of this month, we have 10 facilities accepting proposals. 70 of our experiments have been performed to date. So we're still uh, working our way through the cycle four experiments to, um, to get us up to the rest of these ones that were awarded last year. And we've got a, num a total of 1,200 um, attend, uh, well, I guess members or users that are um, interacting with LaserNet US at this stage. All right, so you want to do an experiment um, with LaserNet US. You have an idea. And so what and how do you get access to our network? Um, and so we follow a model um, of a 
peer reviewed proposal process, um, which is very uh, similar to um, a lot of these hot uh, mid to large scale facilities, and we've adopted best practices from a number of these proposal review uh, processes. And so um, just at the very, very high level, a research proposal um, is a document, a formal document that explains what, why, and how. So what your idea is, what you plan to research, why we, why it's worth researching. So what is the um, context for that, for that work, um, and how, how are these going to lead to um, a, a broader impact for our community and society as a whole. And lastly, how you plan on doing it. So how and providing the details so that the proposal review panel and the facilities can evaluate it for um, technical feasibility. And so from to kind of break it down into a set of steps. Um, there's seven total steps um, from the I, I, like first idea that you have um, through to the award um, from DOE to uh, perform your experiment. And so if you do get an award through LaserNet US, uh, the experimental time at that facility um, is free of charge, um, but user teams are expected to provide the um, kind of the consumables, so their targets um, and the manpower in order to execute those experiments. So currently we are in our, we have an open cycle call, five call for proposals. And so this, what you can see here is the, the timeline for what that looks like. So we announced our call at the end of October. Um, and this is a typical annual cycle for us now. We've kind of settled into a routine for this. So um, moving forward, you can expect similar dates in the future. So we announced our call this year, uh, late October um, with a proposal submission deadline of December 19th. Um, once these proposals are submitted, they are assigned to our proposal review panel. Um, and through this cycle, the proposal review panel um, evaluates the proposals for scientific case and broader impacts. And then the facility point of contacts, which I'll um, introduce in a few, uh, few slides later, provide a technical feasibility review, um, which allows us to announce the awarded experiments in April 2023. Now, these experiments, once they are awarded, um, the scheduling at each of the individual facilities is, um, is a, uh, an open communication or an open dialogue between the uh, spokesperson and the facility themselves, because things like uh, technical feasibility or, or maybe lead times for your targets um, or potentially putting experiments that use similar configurations or diagnostics back to back to minimize um, kind of the turnover time um, are all important considerations. Um, that are best handled at the facility level themselves. Um, so cycle five experiments will be scheduled in the timeframe of mid um, mid September through to July of 20 of next year through to July of 2024. So our cycle five call for proposals um, was announced um, and we have two documents that are very important to refer to uh, while first coming up with your proposal ideas, um, and then also preparing that proposal document. Um, so if you visit this website here, so our, on our LaserNet US website, lasernetus.org slash proposal, we have two documents that are available for download. First one is our guidelines. So this outlines um, who is eligible to submit a proposal, um, things like what um, our expectations are for um, teams that are awarded time, like who needs to be acknowledged, um, the safety considerations and our expectations. Um, so this is kind of your first point that it's important to review this document as there are changes between cycles. Um, next thing you wanna get started with is this proposal template. So this is something new that we've introduced um, this cycle um, at the request of the user community to um, streamline and make um, the review process more consistent and standardized across proposals so that we can uh, clearly communicate the evaluation criteria. So in that document, you'll see specific questions that the PRP will consider when evaluating your proposal, um, which also lets us to then give really detailed feedback on areas for improvement um, when if you were to resub if your experiment is not awarded and you're going to try to improve it for a, a subsequent call. Um, as we're um, as we're also trying to um, engage with the a more broad um, and larger user community, um, we've spent a lot of time this past year, um, year or two, developing proposal writing resources to actually support new users. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, the 
the LaserNet US I use um, hosted their second annual How to Write a Successful LaserNet US Proposal. And so this um, in this presentation, uh, it's available now on YouTube. We go through, um, there's a similar presentation about what LaserNet US is, but more importantly, um, Ari goes through and gives um, kind of her perspective um, and advice and guidance on, on the things we're looking for and how, how to best formulate your proposal. Um, and as I mentioned before, this this template document um, with these specific examples and writing prompts of what we're looking for. Something that is also very special about LaserNet US um, compared to some of the other calls for proposals um, is that we also have a strong prioritization of broader impacts of the research. Um, and so when you're what you'll see is in our proposal template, there's actually a section where we want to see how the work that you are proposing um, fits into a broader context. And so the things that we um, specifically ask are, who is the benefit? Um, are you a new user to the LaserNet US community? Um, what, what impact can this have on society? And there's lots of ways that your, their, that your work can have broader impacts. And so we want you to explain to us um, where this fits in your community, in your research fields, and more broadly within, within the community. Like, for example, providing uh, training opportunities. And so one of the, the best ways and meaningful ways that LaserNet US um, is aiming to grow the community um, is to support workforce. And so we really want to see and, and have you clearly explain to us um, the people, the people, even at the kind of PhD level who are involved um, within the project, whether it's going to be part of their thesis or whether this will be one of their first experiments to get exposure to how to um, field diagnostics or design potentially their own experiment later in their PhD studies. Um, and so another key component of LaserNet US proposals um, is that technical feasibility um, is reviewed by the uh, point of contacts at the facilities, um, and that's, this will be incorporated into the um, awarding process. And so while we, when you are submitting a LaserNet US proposal, we do have you acknowledge through this checkbox here, it's kind of small, apologies for that, um, that you have contacted the facility to talk about technical feasibility. And so we highly recommend that as soon as possible within this process of preparing your proposal that you reach out to these designated point of contacts um, in order to start the discussion about technical feasibility to most importantly identify any showstoppers or things that may um, influence the way in which you perform your experiment. There are things like for example, the duration of experiments at our facilities is highly variable um, and it varies depending on the local support the technical complexity, perhaps maybe a new capability that needs to be developed um, prior to your experiment being um, being fielded, and all of these things um, are need to be really an open communication with the facilities um, in advance of submission. So in this um, in this call, um, we have now ten facilities that are participating. Um, so our most recent addition was the Institute for the Frontier of Attosecond Science and Technology, or shortened to IFAST, at the University of Central Florida. Um, and on the LaserNet US website, we have um, a highly detailed um, page for each of these facilities where you can look at the capabilities offered. Um, and if there are any things, things that you require in addition to what is stated um, on the LaserNet US website, it's really important um, that these are communicated in advance. I just kind of want to emphasize that point is if, if you need anything in addition to what is stated, it's really important to ask those questions. Um, something I also want to clarify um, from previous cycles is the way in which we handle primary and secondary facilities. Um, so when you submit a proposal, um, you typically design, you write it for um, a, a primary facility. And within this, the page limit, it's very difficult, we understand, to, to have the same experiment possible at two facilities. And so in the proposal template, what you'll do is you'll have a section where it discusses changes to the proposal or maybe changes in scope or parameters or scans um, for an experiment to be um, applied to a secondary facility. But what's really important is that um, by putting a secondary facility, you're actually 
maximizing your uh, possibility at getting awarded time. Um, and so the way that this works is if you have primary and secondary, your proposal will first go into competition at that primary facility, um, and it'll be ranked within those set of experiments. Now, if it does not reach the level of being competitive or shortlisted at the primary facility, then we transfer it to the competition for what you list as your secondary facility. Um, and what I don't mention here as well is um, sometimes the proposal review panel can identify even a third facility where the proposal may be um, may be possible. So if you're not competitive at primary or secondary, the PRP may come back to the spokesperson and say, hey, have you considered maybe doing your experiment at this facility? Um, based on my experience at this facility, I think it might be possible. What do you think? And at that stage, the spokesperson would have the um, option to accept or deny that transfer to competition at that third facility. And so we really uh, want to do the best that we can to, um, to find a good match for the proposed work to be to, to get time at the facilities. Um, all right, so there have been some changes uh, since this past cycle, which I just would like to take a moment to highlight. Um, so, and which will have quite a large impact on the proposals this, this cycle. So the first one um, is that the Omega EP laser facility um, will only be accepting proposals that are related to inertial fusion energy in cycle five. Um, so as you know, there's a lot of community momentum um, behind IFE in, since the kind of 0808 shot. Um, and so LaserNet US is going to be using um, its time at Omega EP to support this um, these kind of this type of work. Um, if you have questions about this, please feel free to reach out to us and we can provide additional information there. Um, next, the Texas, Pato, Texas Petawatt laser um, will actually be available for a full uh, run of LaserNet US experiments. Um, both Titan and Janus lasers at Jupiter Laser Facility will resume operations. Um, as I said, this is our first cycle where IFAST will be accepting proposals. Um, it is going to be restricted to the uh, 2.5 micron laser during this cycle, um, expanding to the rest of the lasers um, in, in future calls. Um, and lastly, the um, 100 terawatt beam line at the Extreme Light uh, Laboratory will be available. Okay, so now you've got a proposal, you've got an idea, you've talked to your facility, you're all ready to go. Um, how do you submit it? Um, so we have um, a system that we use um, on that you access through the LaserNet US website, um, and the spokesperson of the proposal will navigate to this portal system from the website or using this start submission button. And the so spokesperson is the person that is going to uh, complete the submission process. So at this time, only the spokesperson will require um, an account on this LaserNet US portal. And so I just wanted to um, explain a little for everybody here uh, what our terminology is in, for the different people involved in the experiment. Um, so the spokesperson itself, the person submitting the proposal, um, is the primary administrative contact for the experiment. Um, and then additionally, we have what's considered the lead PI. And so the lead PI in this case uh, typically conceives of the idea, designs the experiment, leads the experimental team and analysis effort after the experiment. In it, and in almost all cases, the spokesperson and the lead PI are the same. Um, and LaserNet US does strongly encourage um, uh, students and early career researchers, so postdocs and, and people that are um, only several years past their PhD, to submit proposals as this lead uh, PI role um, to really have ownership and responsibility of the experiments that they are conducting. Um, we have um, instituted a new policy on the recommendation of the Scientific Advisory Board um, for continuity purposes, but also for supervisory purposes, that a co-PI is required for all submissions where a student or postdoc is the lead PI. And so we feel that this is an important step in order to make sure that we have the the um, kind of an experienced person who will remain in the field long term to provide training, oversight, funding, and all of, and and make sure that the resources are available to really execute that experiment. And so, once you actually navigate to this, this is just what it looks like. You'll um, transition to this page, which is in the Slack colors. 
um, and you can log in with a user account and password. If you've ever done experiments at the Slack facility, so like LCLS, SSRL, CryoEM, this is going to be the same uh, username and password. If you've not previously um, engaged with Slack for other user type experiments, you'll need to, the spokesperson will need to register for the first time. Uh, this process does take a little bit of time. So I highly recommend um, that you do at least the spokesperson registration um, as far in advance of the deadline as possible. Okay, last but not least, um, if you have questions throughout this process, there's a large number of people that you can reach out to to get uh, feedback. Um, so I will post these slides, uh, so no need to kind of rush to write it down right now. But for general inquiries, questions, and feedback, um, the best person to contact for those is myself. Um, anything technical questions about the facilities um, and the feasibility of your experiment and your ideas should be directed to the LaserNet US facility designated point of contacts, um, which are all listed on the LaserNet US website. Ariana Gleason's happy to answer questions about proposals. And I use is your best place for anything related to user engagement. Um, during cycle five, um, we will be able to provide uh, limited support for travel and consumables. So things like targets for awarded experiments. Um, I will be issuing an application form for that, which will require a detailed um, budget breakdown um, and justification document. Um, so anyone that is awarded experimental time, I will reach out to you with that, um, with the instructions for that. Um, which will then be submitted to both Kramer and myself um, before being awarded. Um, just to show you what it looks like, so on the LaserNet US website, um, if you navigate to any of the facilities specifically, the designated point of contact is listed on the right-hand side um, of the page with their, their phone number and their email address. Lastly, a new initiative um, for uh, user support writing these proposals is um, actually an office hours that's gonna be held every Friday through teleproposal deadline from 10 to noon Pacific. Um, this is a new initiative um, being spearheaded by Scott Feaster. So this is the Zoom, the Zoom number here um, to get into that. There's no password or anything. You can just um, enter those numbers. And if you have any questions, if you don't know where to get started, you're not sure the best person to talk to, um, anything like that, uh, drop in at any time during that, that window and, and Scott or anyone from IU's manning that will be able to give you, give you some pointers on where to go. And one thing that moving forward, so if this is your first time um, and maybe you saw this um, event on, on LinkedIn or were referred from maybe one of your colleagues, um, if you're interested in um, receiving kind of more regular updates about LaserNet US, um, you can navigate to the LaserNet US website, so lasernetus.org slash join. Um, and enter your information here to subscribe to our listserv. So this is the main um, and official channel that we use to communicate between LaserNet US management and the user community um, and give things like calls for proposals, reminders or events that we're putting on. Um, we use it quite infrequently. It's really for the kind of the high level um, information. So we promise not to spam you, um, but it would be definitely a good idea to put us in your um, in your known senders list so that you make sure you get our your updates not going to your spam folder. Um, and lastly, we have expanded um, last year actually onto the major social media platforms. Um, so we, I just posed the links here uh, for your reference where we uh, use these much more frequently. So things that are going on, experiment highlights, uh, new capabilities that are being offered, uh, updates about our users meeting. So I encourage everyone to, to check those out and follow them. You can access them directly through these links. Um, there's also buttons within the LaserNet US website um, to, to direct you, link you to those. And so with that, I will just leave you with um, a big reminder that uh, the current call has the cycle five deadline on December 19th at 4 p.m. Pacific. And I will thank you for your attention and I will take any questions. Any questions from anyone? Feel free to use the chat or the Q&A. Okay, we'll go on. Um, but as questions occur to you, you can continue to use the chat and QA Q and A at any time. Sounds good. All right, I've released the screen, so you should be able to share now. Thank you very much, Shonda. Excellent presentation.
So is my screen successfully shared? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, good. Let me reconfigure my windows. They always move around. Let me change sharing. Good, I think that's it. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. So what we're going to do in this section is have a uh, um, uh, an overview of the various facilities. LaserNet US consists of 10 facilities at universities and national labs. Our facilities uh, have lasers that span a range of pulse energies, pulse durations, shot rates, and wavelengths. So there's quite a lot of versatility here. And each facility brings its own wrinkle as to how you might do an experiment. What we'd like to do here is cover the big issues to give you a sense of what each of the facilities can do as you decide which might be best for your experiment. The facilities are listed in order here. Let's see, am I still sharing successfully? Yes. Okay, great. So the, list, the facilities are listed in the order that I'm going to cover them. So uh, if you're watching on video, you can scroll right to the facility that you want to hear about. There's going to be a single presenter, me, describing uh, um, uh, each of the facility uh, using a presentation based on three slides per facility, each with the same organization, describing the laser, the experimental capabilities, and then talking about facility operations. However, all the POCs are here and they can answer specific questions about the facility. As Chandra described, it's not only required, it's important to talk to facilities before you finish writing your grant, your proposal and submitting it. And we encourage you to start that conversation here if you like. After the facilities overview, there'll be a panel where uh, we'll all be available to answer any questions that remain or any questions that come up. Some of the things that you should think about is that many of the ways in which a facility could be of use to might not be ones that you're aware of or even that are listed on the website because they involve the interaction between the intricacies of your experiment and the facility that you might be considering. Likewise, there might be limitations in a facility that aren't listed explicitly on the website, but might be specific to how you want to do your experiment. So for example, there are many different operating modes. If your experiment requires changing between operating modes, that might be a flick of a switch that can be done quickly, or that might require days of setup time. And that's something you need to take into account. To repeat one thing that Chandra said, it's important to remember that the facilities play no role in the evaluation of the scientific merit or broader impact review of your proposal. We don't even see most of the proposals. As a consequence, <clears throat> we can play an active role without fear of bias in helping you design your proposal to make sure that it's feasible and that you take the full advantage of the capabilities of the facility that you want to use. Another thing that can't be determined simply from either this presentation or the more detailed discussions on the website is that our facilities work together, sharing equipment and expertise. So as an example, Slack recently supplied an X-ray camera for a University of Michigan experiment that was performed at Bella. And so the loans of these equipment to each other increase our capability. Likewise, DOE can provide a small amount of extra funding for facility uh, upgrades to make them more viable for your experiment. So the long focal length, focal length con uh, configurations at CSU and OSU came about in that way. If you're new to LaserNet US, you may not be sure which facility is best for your experiment. Just call one of us and we can talk to you, learn a little bit about your experiment and direct you to what we think might be the best facility. Again, um, there should be a conversation before you finish your proposal, especially if you're new to LaserNet US, and this town hall can be the beginning of that conversation. So <clears throat> that's the map of uh, facilities in terms of pulse duration and pulse energy space that Chandra showed. And now I'm gonna start with the first facility, which is the matter and extreme conditions uh, uh, in station at the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. And the POC for this is Gillis Dyer. Okay, so it's important to remember that um, 
Although the MEC is an important end station at Slack, LaserNet US time on MEC is laser only time. So if you want uh, free electron x-rays, you have to go through uh, their proposal process for that. Now, some experiments have been done with x-rays, but they were um, at MEC through LaserNet US, but those were derived using Datatron. So what do we have? We have a long pulse laser and a short pulse laser. The long pulse laser has four amplified arms, which are then multiplexed to create two beams for the experiment. These are nanosecond long scale length uh, lasers, um, and they have precision pulse shaping. The short pulse laser system is at the one joule level, but operates at high rep rate, five hertz, and can use a uh, F5 uh, focusing mirror as its standard focusing optic. So this will take you to relativistic intensities. The contrast of this laser is excellent. At the 30 picosecond and greater range, the contrast exceeds 10 to the 11, which is at the measurement limit of their device. There are also other modes, for example, where you can get molecule pulses at 120 hertz, so very high rep rate indeed. It has a range of laser diagnostics, and so um, uh, um, apparatus for monitoring and logging the performance of the long pulse lasers. Those are a one shot per minute system. For short pulse, there's a wide range of diagnostics. So for example, spider and single shot autocorrelation for short pulse measurement, but a tundra to get high contrast measurement <clears throat> to look at uh, pre-pulse and things like that. So uh, there are standard configurations. There's a standard configuration for uh, beam delivery for the long pulse mode. And uh, um, when using their F3.1 optic, that will give you uh, um, spot sizes of the size indicated. Standard beam delivery for the short pulse model, for the short pulse uh, um, laser system, uh, has uh, an F6.6 .6 focusing to take you to a peak power exceeding 2.5 times 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. And there's an option for second harmonic generation. The experimental diagnostics, um, um, many of which um, have a, um, uh, an X-ray focus. Um, in all of these presentations, if you see something bolded, that's a new capability. So even if you're familiar, familiar with the facility, this will help draw your eye to things that are new. So we see that there's a shielded quartz cylindrical crystal spectrometer, but they also have large area in vacuum pixel array detectors, HAPG von Hema spectrometers, visors, and so forth. MEC boasts a very large uh, technical staff. So although your initial point of contact should be Gillis, you may be uh, switched to a point of contact that has specialized knowledge in the diagnostic that you want or the way in which you want to operate. And that's all uh, to the good. Um, MEC operates most of the year as an LCLS, LCLS instrument. And so LaserNet US time is scheduled during LCLS downtimes. All of the facilities have um, uh, aspects to when they schedule their, their experiments and constraints. So if you're awarded time, one of the first things that will happen is that you'll talk with the facility that you're going to run at to come up with a mutually agreeable time. And so this facility is no exception. The typical LaserNet US experiment time window is about three weeks for this facility. And that will vary on a facility by facility basis. And we'll discuss that. Some recent experiments that have been performed include high pressure science, proof of principle, uh, work in support of LCLS MEC proposals. This is a real benefit of LaserNet US time. Um, you can get the more difficult aspects of the laser side of your experiment um, uh, um, under control before you submit a proposal for LCLS time on the MEC. And then uh, laser wake field acceleration and Datatron X-ray probing have all been done. So that's the MEC. Questions from anyone on this before we go to the next facility? I'll pause for questions after each coverage. Okay. So we will go on to the advanced uh, laser light source, ALS. This is at INRS, and the POC is uh, Francois Legare. Okay, so uh, again, following the same pattern, uh, lasers overview, experiment overview, facility operation. Uh, 
<clears throat> there are three beam lines. There are three main beam lines at all. Two are based on 150 terawatt laser and are typically used for photon and electron acceleration experiments. And so you see the specifications here, 3.2 joules and a high rep rate system operating at 2.5 Hertz. There's also the third line, an infrared beam line, and these are operating well into the infrared, operating at 100 hertz, two cycle duration pulses up to five millijoules per pulse. And so that's a different class of experiments that you can do. Um, a range of laser diagnostics. New capabilities for 2023 include these three bulleted items. So 100 kilohertz, 200 watt, a turbine pumped OPCPA system, a one kilohertz, 25 watt, a turbine laser system. So that's 25 millijoules per pulse at a kilohertz. And there's a new end station for angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. I see the question in Q and A. We'll get to that. Um, so thank you. We'll get to that um, um, in the break after this one, after uh, this facility. <clears throat> Target area. So this is a picture of the laser wake field acceleration betatron X-ray beam line. They can routinely produce 400 MeV uh, energy electrons. 20 keV uh, critical energy x-rays, and again, at a rep rate of 2.5 hertz. They also have an ion acceleration beam line. And so here you can get proton energies of 9 MeV, 10 to the 11 protons per shot. Now, as you know, in ion acceleration, target handling is a bigger challenge than it is for gas target experiments. They've achieved a target refreshment rate of 0 0.625 hertz, and they can acquire 1,600 shots per day. So this is data collection with error bars and good statistical analysis. For staff, they have one research associate, one laser technician, and one engineer. They encourage the use of the experimental configurations already in place, but if you want to do something different, do make sure to talk to them. Uh, recent typical campaign topics include laser wake field acceleration, betatron X-ray imaging, Betatron X-ray imaging, uh, PNSA ion acceleration, uh, PIXI, which is particle-induced X-ray emission, terahertz generation, and applications of the various secondary radiation that you can get. A point that they want to leave you with is that because of the large number of shots and the stability of these systems, great stats are possible, and you can collect large amounts of data in a short period of time. So, for example, they've done experiments involving tomography, which, as you know, requires a lot of shots. Okay, that's alls. Um, before I ask for questions on alls, we do have a question for MEC. Gillis, can you take that? Sure, I'll take it live. Um, so we do have some information on the uh, MEC instrument website about different pulse shapes. It, the, the question is, what energy levels can one expect when using the MEC laser? It pulses longer than 10 nanoseconds, say 20 or 30 nanoseconds. Um, the the power of the laser will be lower for those square pulses. Uh, generally, you might be able to squeak out a little bit more energy, but it's a similar uh, similar amount of energy for the longer pulses. Um, and uh, so, for example, say something, uh, a square pulse being delivered at, uh, say, 3 gigawatts over over 20 nanoseconds again. Uh, 60 joules in a in a 20 nanosecond pulse is a, is an example that we've done. But uh, when when designing your experiment, you should talk to our laser people and and provide uh, the pulse shapes that you're interested in. Great, thank you. Do we have uh, questions? Other questions for MEC? Or are there any questions on alls? Enter them into the chat or the Q and A. If not, we'll go on. So our next uh, facility is the Scarlet Laser Facility at Ohio State. I'm the POC for that. So Scarlet is primarily intended to look at uh, relativistic laser plasma interactions. Scarlet can readily achieve intensities exceeding 5 times 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter. Um, Scarlet has a contrast on a nanosecond scale of 10 to the minus 10, so it's good for shooting thin targets. Scarlet has two main modes of operation, a high power 300 terawatt mode at one shot per minute and a low power 10 terawatt mode at 10 hertz. We've only had one user ask for the 10 terawatt mode, but 
but of course they were able to collect a rather large number of shots in a short period of time. This is a 30 femtosecond laser system. It has two focal geometries, F2 tight focus. That's how you get above five times 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter. We have a very nice spot size between two and three microns, pretty clean. And we also have a long focal length geometry, F17, divided, um, uh, designed by uh, uh, Jenny Cochran from Lawrence Livermore and commissioned in an experiment a year or two ago. We have a range of uh, laser diagnostics, a vacuum autocorrelator, an SHG frog. We can do pulse contrast measurements uh, to 10 to the minus, uh, to 10 to the 10 uh, orders of magnitude dynamic range. Um, these measurements, uh, looking for even the smallest pre-pulse, typically takes several hours to perform. That's true of all the facilities. So for any of us, if you want a measurement like that, you should contact us in advance to make sure that'll be needed. And we also have on-shot diagnostics, uh, including an equivalent plane shot. So we know what the laser spatial mode looks like on every shot, and that's available as part of the data set. And we have some beam jitter, and so we can tell you uh, approximately where the beam was on each shot. We're commissioning a new operating mode, um, which will involve pulse shaping. And so that might be available for cycle five, assuming we're successful in cycle four. We'll know um, in spring of uh, uh, 2023. <clears throat> uh, the target area, we have a chamber, which is a three quarter scale version of the Titan chamber, an extremely successful chamber, um, very open, easy to work in and configure. We have a range of diagnostics, for example, a Thompson parameter, uh, parabola ion spectrometer um, with the microchannel plate detector. So it's rep rated magnetic spectrometers and electron spectrometer, um, laser reflection and imaging. One novel diagnostic is that we can provide a polarimeter. So we can completely characterize the polarization of the light, at least assuming that it's uh, spatially uniform. We can use radiochromic film, although of course that slows the repetition, the data collection repetition rate down by quite a bit. We have a range of ways of um, uh, getting the target into the right position, characterizing the position and the quality of the target, as do all the facilities. That's the kind of thing I want to talk to facilities about. How will my target get aligned on a shot-by-shot -shot basis? For facility status, um, we have uh, two full-time staff, Becky and Ali. And uh, by the time cycle five starts, we'll have hired a third. There are uh, two people leading the facility, myself and Enam Chowdhury, who designed Scarlet. The typical run duration is four weeks. And thus far, we have delivered about 30 weeks of experiments thus far, not counting special setup times. Users, users should be prepared to set up their experiment in the chamber, so make sure you bring enough people. Um, we... Uh, um, uh, manage uh, uh, the vacuum system, opening the chamber and closing it. But once it's open, you can go in and put hands on and put optics where they need to be. The kinds of experiments we've done lately include relativist studying uh, the relativistic laser plasma interaction using light with orbital angular momentum. Here's a picture of the phase derived from the orbital, uh, the OAM light that we used in one experiment, and you can see it's a nice spiral. Uh, we've done experiments on the fundamental relativistic ionization and electron emission uh, effects, proton and deuteron ion acceleration, relativistic transparency. We've uh, done some experiments on platform development and picture catcher geometries to produce neutrons. New capabilities is that we have two neutron time of flight detectors that were contributed by Lawrence Livermore, which we're very grateful for. And as I said, we're commissioning uh, pulse shaping capability. Uh, final thing is that if your experiment needs CH targets, and particularly if it needs very thin CH targets, say down to 20 nanometers, we can provide those at no cost using liquid crystal technology. The liquid crystal technology is very powerful and effective for some kinds of things. For example, it's great for synchronizing a pump and a probe and a pump probe experiment, but there's other aspects of the technology that are finicky. So if you want to use these, talk to us, and we can tell you what's possible. Questions for Scarlett. <clears throat> yes, we can switch between the low power 10 hertz mode and the high power one shot per minute mode uh, fairly quickly. That's one of the ones that's a flip of a switch. 
On the other hand, um, another two modes that we offer is a short focal length mode and a long focal length mode. That requires moving opti optics around and realigning it. That takes much more time, days. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Okay, very good. The Extreme Light Laboratory, University of Nebraska Lincoln, and Don Unstetter is the point of contact. <clears throat> so, there are two primary lasers. There are two primary lasers at the ELL, Diocles and Archimedes. You're seeing a top-down view of Diocles. Uh, Don likes to point out that um, uh, they're in a nice location in the center of town, and so there's lots of great hotels and restaurants and things with an easy walking distance of the facility. Uh, there are three separate and independent uh, ways these uh, laser systems can be used. So Diocles can run uh, with a peak power of as high as 0.7 petawatt and a 0.1 hertz repetition rate. And then Diocles and Archimedes both have high repetition rate modes at lower power, running at a very high rep rate of 10 hertz. So Diocles can do 110 watts, 100 terawatts. And as you see, Archimedes is listed here as uh, 10 terawatts and 10 hertz. For laser diagnostics, they have a range of autocorrelators and pulse characterization measurements, as well as spatial profiles, such as a shaft hartman interferometer and pulse energy measurements. Uh, this facility uh, um, is in its own building. And so it has uh, actively controlled laboratory temperature and humidity and vibration dampening. And so stable operation is possible with this system. There are separate uh, laser uh, target interaction areas. And so we see the one for Diocles. Experimental diagnostics include fast scopes, uh, digital A uh, um, pulse generators for timing your electronics, electron spectrometers, and a range of, of imaging systems from Lennox screens and image plates to X-ray CCD cameras, also X-ray spectrometers. Facility status, um, uh, um, talk to the facility if uh, uh, you want to explore uh, laser parameter customization and uh, they can help with electronic and mechanical fabrication. Typical areas of previous experiments are laser wake field acceleration, microwave generation, X-ray phase contrast interest imaging, inner shell ionic transitions, ion acceleration, and nonlinear Thompson scattering. The nonlinear Thompson scattering experiment required a lot of shots. And so stable operation at a high, relatively high rep rate was important for the success of that experiment. Typically runs on uh, these systems go for four weeks. Questions on the Extreme Light Laboratory? <clears throat> okay, we'll go on. So the next facility is the Advanced Beam Laboratory which features the Aleph laser. And this is at Colorado State University. And the point of contact is Jorge Roca. So the Aleph laser uh, can operate in uh, one of four modes. It can operate at its fundamental at 800 nanometers and the second harmonic at 400 nanometers. The second harmonic mode is probably is easily the most popular one um, requested by uh, um, the users of LEF uh, because of the very high contrast. So LEF can shoot very thin targets. This is a near this is a near petawatt class uh, laser system, and it can operate at a high rep rate with 3.3 hertz in burst mode. So you can collect a lot of data in a short period of time. And as I said, this is successfully demonstrated um, tomography. There are also two focal geometries, a short focal length mode, F2, and a long focal length mode, F25. <clears throat> so this is an overview of the uh, um, data collection area. And so there are 
uh, two major chamber systems, one here, this is a 1.2 meter diameter system that houses the F2 optic. And so this is where you're going to do um, experiments at the highest intensities. But if you want to use the long focal length geometry, and uh, primarily that's been used, say, for gas tar target experiments, but not entirely, um, they can bypass uh, the optics in the system and go to a long focal length OAP here and then operate in a chamber over here. And so this is listed as a new capability. Uh, this facility has a wide range of diagnostics. Keep in mind that in all the cases where we're listing diagnostics, we're usually just listing the subset. And so here we've got listed high resolution X-ray spectrometers, uh, X-ray diode arrays, X -ray, an X-ray street camera uh, provided by Lawrence Livermore, Thompson parabolas for uh, particle measurement, electron spectrometers, and a large number of NTOFs. The ability of, uh, of uh, the Advanced Beam Laboratory to reconfigure its chambers is significant and uh, um, more dramatic than is indicated by this figure. So if you have a somewhat different experimental configuration that uh, you want to consider, please talk to the people there uh, uh, because their ability to uh, move the beam lines in the chambers around is prodigious. <clears throat> Facility status, 21 LaserNet US experiments have been completed so far. Um, and uh, you'll see that there's a large, uh, highly talented staff here that makes all this possible. I won't lead every experiment, but I'll, I won't read every experiment, but let me describe a few and note the papers down at the bottom. So multi-GEV laser wake field electron acceleration, streaked X-ray Doppler shift spectroscopy, high repetition rate bright neutron generation, enhanced Vetatron X-ray generation, X-ray resolution, high resolution atomic X-ray spectroscopy, and direct electron acceleration in uh, laser plasma transparency and so on. Are there any questions for uh, Jorge and, uh, uh, and this facility? <clears throat> okay, our next facility is Bella at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Cameron Geddes is the point of contact. So um, this is another facility that has a number of different lasers and a number of different operating modes. And so one of the things I need to try to do is at least give a sense for what these modes are. So the Petawak system um, is a 40 joule laser, 40 femtosecond duration, high rep rate at one hertz. Um, this was the first uh, 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 one hertz Petawak system in operation in the United States. Uh, with two focal length geometries, uh, F65 and F2.5. There's also the HTW system, which stands for 100 terawatt. And this is a two beam system providing both two joule and half joule beams at 40 femtoseconds at an even higher rep rate of five hertz. So all of these are titanium sapphire based systems as you can see from the wavelength. And um, uh, they can be used for a variety of different things. The long focal length mode of the Petawak system was primar is primarily dedicated to high energy electron through uh, various acceleration mechanisms. The short focal length uh, uh, mode of the petawatt laser system is a new operational mode. And that can be used for, that's good for things such as ion acceleration. In the case of the uh, um, short focal length operational mode of the petawatt laser system, the laser is brought through uh, a chamber, a long focal length chamber before it gets to the short focal length chamber. And so the intent is to put in a double plasma mirror system in that chamber for the future. So uh, there's more to look forward to. So the left picture shows an example of the short focal length target chamber. And the middle picture shows a picture of the long focal length uh, target picture and the overall geometry is in the right. A range of diagnostics. There are a lot of di diagnostics for working with accelerated electron beams. And so a magnetic electron spectrometer, 
multiple CCD cameras, um, diagnostics operating at the high repetition rate that the laser can operate, and uh, so on, as well as a range of optical diagnostics. In the, in the case of the HTW system, you can configure the dual beam uh, in different ways. Uh, the system, the two dual beam can be focused to intensities exceeding 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. And uh, uh, you can get a range of, of pulse durations. Uh, they, in some cases, have bypassed the compressor to get extra long pulses of several hundred femtoseconds. And so, for example, experiments have been done where one beam drives um, uh, electron acceleration, and then another beam is used to drive a shock, which is probed. So a wide variety of configurations. If this sounds like there's some connection between this and the experiments you want to do, you should talk to them to see what's possible. LaserNet US experiments on cycles uh, one through four have typically run four weeks using a range of the different focusing geometries and the uh, um, versatility of the two beam HDW system. Uh, so for example, they've looked at high resolution HED shock imaging. That's what I referred to a couple of times already. The development of high uh, rate uh, uh, plasma mirrors that can operate at a petawatt and uh, even MEV high resolution industrial imaging and tomography data collection. An important note here, experimental capabilities beyond access to the lasers should be done in collaboration with the expert Bella staff. So for example, if you want to look at laser plasma acceleration of electrons or ions and so forth, you should talk to them about working in a collaborative mode. Questions about Bella? Okay, the Texas Petawatt laser. <clears throat> so uh, the Texas Petawatt laser is at the University of Texas at Austin, and it's um, the major part of the Center for High Energy Density Science. When we discussed this laser last year at the town hall for cycle four, the presentation was given by Todd Dittmeyer, but the point of contact is now Sandy Bruce. And Sandy Bruce knows the system extremely well. She is uh, associate director at the center, and it has been a real pleasure working with her uh, um, uh, since she joined the, the LaserNet US team. So the Texas Petawatt laser is a glass flash lamp pump laser. It uses uh, mixed glass for bandwidth, so it gets down to very short pulses of 100 femtoseconds. And but it has high it has high energy up to 130 joules per pulse. It uses an F3 focusing optic to achieve greater than 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter. It has a short focal length and a long focal length geometry. The long focal length geometry is usually used for gas targets, but it has been used for solid targets. The shot rate of the system is about one shot per hour. However, it has a so-called rot shot mode where it produces lower energy pulses at a higher repetition rate. And Sandy tells me that the users have found this very useful for uh, the early phases of an experiment before they go to the higher powers. A pro beam is available. If you need this, discuss this with the facility. Uh, and this is a millijoule scale beam at either the fundamental or the second harmonic with a range of uh, pulse durations. Many of the facilities in LaserNet US can provide a probe beam by taking a beam off from the main beam. We can do that at Scarlet. And so if you need a probe beam, uh, um, that's something that you should also discuss with the facility. Probe beams that are based on a pickoff have some limits, but they can be quite useful. Uh, there's also a long pulse pump probe available um, with the specifications given down here. Texas Petawatt is one of the facilities providing nanosecond pulse operation, um, making it a very unique and useful uh, facility in the constellation of LaserNet US facilities. A range of diagnostics, um, including near field and far field and pulse duration. Uh, they have two primary uh, uh, target areas, the TC1 short focus chamber. And so this is an F3 system. Uh, 
they have an F1 focusing optic. And if you want to use that, you should discuss that with the facility. Working with F1 optics is tough. And so that makes everything harder. Uh, but this is something that they can provide and have used before successfully. The TC2 is the long focus tar target chamber, and that's an F40 system. And um, um, uh, there's an illustration here. Some of the popular experimental diagnostics that they're using VAS for are the are image plates. Um, uh, users brought in image plates, and an image plate scanner is provided. Electron positron spectrometer is a Faraday cup for ion time of flight. Thompson parabola pra spectrometer for particle measurement, and Visar um, at 532 nanometers. Also, a range of power meters, cameras, spectrometers, and the like. Uh, there's some important things that I need to read here. So uh, in this case, the uh, shot hours that the facility operates are provided. Experimental runs usually run from four to five weeks with the first week dedicated to experimental setup. Uh, and as I've said before, common experiments are things like laser wake field on TC2 and electron proton acceleration from solid density targets on TC1. Uh, the section here is important. TC, TPW experiment are predominantly user-driven. User teams should typically have three to five experimentalists on-site at all times for optimum staffing. On receiving on-site training, users are expected to pump and vent the vacuum chamber on each shot as necessary, place and align targets and diagnostics, do the fine adjustment for the focusing optic to produce the desired quality, collect, save, store, and analyze experimental data, perform radiation scans and the like. Users are provided with a range of equipment, of course, and the laser setup is done by Texas Petawatt staff. And the firing is done by Texas Petawatt staff. And there are target-based scientists to assist with all these issues. So this is a great chance for young career scientists to learn all the ins and outs and experiments. And this kind of thing is present at all the facilities, although it will differ from facility to facility. So for example, at, Lays at, at Scarlet, we do not want the users touching the vacuum system at all. We open and close the chamber, but once the chamber is open, Users can go in and, and work with their hands. So again, you'll want to know how the facility does the various things that it does so you can design the best experiment for it. This is very useful and detailed information from the Texas Petawatt. Let's see here. I see um, uh, a question that was in the Q&A, so let me get to that first. Would it be possible to have the number of applications per facility and the number of allocated beam times facility on the last call. I'm not sure I understand what that means. Oh, you want the uh, the results from the last call. Uh, we have that information. I will leave that to uh, um, I'll leave that to the PRP to decide what what is the best information to provide. Is it possible to get more details? Ah, this is a question for uh, uh, for Bella. Yeah, I'll I'll take it. It's uh, Jeroen van Tilburg stepping in for Cameron Gaddis here. So um, please repeat the question and thanks. Yeah. So the question is: Is it possible to get more details on the MEV photon Compton source available at Bella? Uh, absolutely, and I would love to. Uh, you know, we, we'd love to talk more to you uh, regarding exactly what you're uh, asking for. But I. I can say we, uh, with the drive laser on the 100 terawatt system, we generate electron beams uh, up to you know, 700 MeV, uh, 200, 300, 400 MeV. And so by uh, scattering that off uh, the scatter laser, uh, the, the uh, gammas are uh, quasi-monoenergetic and monochromatic, uh, around one and a half or two mega electron volts. And so there's the possibility to you know, vary the timing, the electron energy by uh, controlling the injection point in the accelerator, um, you know, the overlap, we're implementing active stabilization, things like that. So a uh, lot, uh, lot of things to discuss. So feel free to reach out to me uh, later. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that detailed answer. Uh, do we have more questions on any of the facilities covered thus far, and in particular, do we have any questions for the Texas Petawatt? Okay. 
Okay, we'll go on. So our next one is the Jupiter Laser Facility. So there are two points of contact, Bob Cobble and Felicia Albert. Uh, the Jupiter Laser Facility is part of uh, LLML. So this facility is a single shot high energy facility that has been active since 2008. It has a vast user base and a large number of people have gotten their PhDs in part on work from this facility. It's just completed a major upgrade and refurbishment. And so this is a good time uh, 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 for cycle five users. <clears throat> okay, so this facility has three high energy beams going into two target areas. The target areas are referred to as the Titan target area or the Janus uh, target area one, or so just so TA one. One of uh, the high energy beams, a long pulse beam always goes to TA one. And the short pulse beam always goes to the Titan. And then a second uh, long pulse high energy beam can go either to Titan, in which case you have short pulse, long pulse, um, um, you can have short pulse, long pulse combined experiments, or both long pulses can go to TA1, and then you have higher energy uh, double long pulse uh, experiments. The specifications uh, for the systems are here. So for long pulse, 100, uh, 1,000 joules uh, on target. In the first harmonic, 700 joules at the second harmonic, pulse duration out to 20 nanoseconds. Um, a user-defined pulse shape and um, uh, focal spot, pre-pulse level, energy, and these other things are listed here. On the short pulse uh, side, the system uh, is intended to produce uh, 300 joules in the first harmonic in a 400 femtosecond short pulse, or 100 joules in the second harmonic. Uh, that capability is not currently supported. They're still waiting on some gradings to come in to complete the system. Uh, but uh, um, there is operation of the system. And so talk to the points of contact on what your needs are and to see if uh, they can meet them. So here's the target area. So uh, repeating a little bit of what was before. So in the, uh, so for Janus, there are two nanosecond beams, each with a kilojoule. Uh, one beam is fixed, the other can have multiple positions, and you can have second harmonic, and 1D and 2D visor and some wavelength tuning. Stiletto has been demonstrated. Contact them if you'd like to use that. On Titan, um, you can have uh, one short pulse beam and one kilojoule beam. Uh, uh, the short pulse is down to 400 femtoseconds and up to 150 joules. In the, it has uh, um, different focal geometries at F3 focus that's smaller than a 10 micron spot size. It's also possible to employ a probe um, with a millijoule probe beam. There's actually a third laser called Comet. It has, it provides up to two nanosecond beams over uh, um, on the 20 picosecond scale. These are, this is a 12 joule system with a five minute shot cycle, so a higher repetition rate. Janus and Titan work at about two shots per hour. As said before, JLF is uh, completing a four-year refurbishment um, uh, done with support from uh, Livermore and DOE FES. Uh, um, so there is uh, um, operation is expected for the full duration of cycle five. Experimenters receive facility support from the technical staff, but the actual build, execution, and teardown is the responsibility of the experimental team. JLF doesn't support remote operations. A collaborational approach is encouraged um, that will open up access to more diagnostics. JLF experiments involve a large range of HD science, uh, and uh, I particularly enjoy this line here. JLF has been a part of more than 110 PhDs granted over the past decade. Finally, JLF partners with NIF for an annual joint user meeting. If the younger career members uh, looking at this either uh, live or on video, 
I've never been to this uh, uh, user meeting. I strongly recommend it. It's excellent. So questions for um, uh, JLF. <clears throat> okay, we're coming to the end. Um, and we uh, um, have two very different and exciting facilities to conclude this presentation with. So this is the Omega EP laser facility at the laser for uh, at the laboratory for laser energetics. The POC is Ming Xing Wei, who is also vice chair of LaserNet US. Ming Xing, among the many hats that she wears, manages the NNSA funded basic science program um, at the facility. Omega EP is part of the larger Omega facility. Uh, you can think of LaserNet US Time as providing additional access to this valuable facility. So, facility overview. The Omega EP laser system provides four beams of high energy pulses in two configurations. You can have four long pulse um, UV beams operating uh, at pulse durations out to 10 nanoseconds and up to five kilojoules per beam. So this is the highest pulse energy provided by LaserNet UF, US. Um, this can uh, 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 um, go using a uh, F6.5 uh, tight focus geometry, uh, um, can give you tight spot sizes and high intensities. On the other hand, uh, two of the pulses can be figured for short pulse operation. Then the pulse duration can be as short as 700 femtoseconds. The maximum energy follows uh, these ranges depending on the pulse duration that you use. With an F2 OAP, you can get 30 micron spots, and that can give rise to a peak intensity of 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter well into the relativistic regime. Uh, longer uh, F numbers are possible via apodization, but of course that will give you a proportionally reduced energy. The number of experimental diagnostics provided uh, by Omega P is just uh, extraordinary. They have over 80 qualified 10 based instruments in diagnostics. This is a selected list. I'll pick a couple. Notice that there are some in bold. And so there are uh, new X-ray diffraction diagnostics, a scattered light uniformity imager, and a spherical uh, crystal X-ray imager. But the full list um, is much larger than this, and you can go to their website to learn about all the other diagnostics. They also have 20 fixed port instruments and diagnostics, including those uh, in the list. This is the largest suite of diagnostics uh, available from any of the LaserNet US facilities, and it permits uh, an extraordinary range of experiments. For example, you'll see the top of the list is the MyFeds experiments for highly magnetized plasmas. Facility status, um, users are encouraged to come on site, particularly new or less experienced users, but they have uh, many, uh, they have accomplished a number of many successful uh, operations with a remote PI. The typical experimental duration is one to two days, where one day will give you between six and 14 shots, depending on the experiment. So don't ask for a month of shot time. Um, there's also uh, a, a large new uh, and exciting lab office and lab expansion project. So make sure to talk to the facility to make sure that you can get your experiment in at a time that works for uh, both parties. Uh, Omega EP uh, has completed 12 LaserNet US experiments from cycle one to three with five cycle four experiments underway as we speak. And there's a range of topics that have been explored in the list there. Let me repeat. Uh, what Chandra said, uh, they're doing something different for this cycle. The LaserNet US Cycle 5 at Omega P will only accept proposals related to inertial fusion energy research. Uh, so this is an opportunity to use this facility for that kind of uh, research um, where there's a lot of momentum right now. Okay, uh, questions on Omega EP.
Very good. And so we come to IFAS, the newest facility of LaserNet US. So this is at the University of Central Florida. Mike Chinney is the uh, um, uh, uh, POC. IFAS stands for the Institute for the Frontier of Attosecond Science and Technology. This is a very different facility than the other LaserNet US facilities. So um, the primary laser of importance for um, um, this call is the 2.5 micron, 6.5 millijoule, 65 femtoseconds, one kilohertz laser. So it's a short pulse laser at very high breath rate off in the uh, infrared. Uh, IFAS joined us um, just at the beginning of uh, the fourth call for proposals. So this is the first time that they're offering laser time. Um, laser diagnostics um, from the from DC to daylight, so from ultraviolet down well into the uh, uh, infrared, single shot frog and beam uh, profilers. The uh, IFAS OTCPA is a tie sapphire pump optical parametric short pulse amplifier, um, very short pulses, uh, three millijoule pulses, um, and this high rev rate. For the target area, they have a high pressure filamentation chamber, up to five atmosphere pressures and an angular resolved uh, UV to near infrared spectrometer. They also have a gas phase high harmonic generation apparatus and an X-ray spectrometer going out to one KEV. Facility status, um, the loose focusing beam lines for studying filamentation and high harmonic generation are fully operational. Tight focusing beam line is anticipated to be available for the cycle five campaign. They have one research scientist available full time. Previous experimental campaigns involve laser filamentation, laser machining, optical waveform sampling, and higher order harmonic generation. And there is potential for experiments at multiple wavelengths. Look at the table uh, shown below. Contact Mike for details. So this, laser, this facility enables a different range of, uh, of experiments than many of the others and represents a new opportunity for us. Questions on IFAS? <clears throat> okay, so on behalf of all the LaserNet US personnel at all the facilities, thank you for your interest. Uh, either for uh, checking in with us live or if you're looking at the video that will be posted in a couple days. If you're writing a proposal, make sure to talk to facility POCs. Uh, we can help and we want to help. Chandra, uh, I think we're ready to have the uh, panel discussion now. Perfect, that sounds good. All right, so if the POCs want to turn on their cameras and then we will open up the floor to questions that anyone may have. Um, let's see if we can get started here. Hi, Chandra, I just let you know right now we're unable to start on video. So as panelists. Anna, let me start yours here. Yeah, thank you. There you go, you should be able to see oh, it there now. There we go, thank you. Of course. Okay. Sorry, Chandra, I don't have a camera where I am right now, but I am here. No worries. Thanks. I'm not hiding <laughs> from it. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll get started with one. Um, I'll see if there's any questions that that come come in. Um, maybe. Maybe Jorge, can you start me and explain a little bit about kind of the what what the first steps are or what what users should do to initiate the communication with a point of contact? What do you like to see in that initial email? Do you already kind of want to get a sense of the type of experiment or should they start already and ask for a meeting? Um, yeah, and thank you, Chandra. So um, I will start by emphasizing what Doug already said which is that um, it's very important right for um, pis for people writing the proposals to contact the facilities right uh, very early on right to um, basically discuss the experiment 
right? Um, and um, discuss the feasibility, right? Um, and uh, uh, the proposal will go anyway, right, through a feasibility review. So doing that very early, way before submission, to ensure that um, the experiment is feasible, right, already removes, you know, um, a roadblock from the experiments to be to be realized. And then the the answer to the question is very simple. Just you know, um, send an email to the you know a, a point of contact. In that case, you know myself, and uh, we'll set up a Zoom meeting. You know, in the a um, few days, you know, following the, you know, the the email. Awesome, that's really helpful. Um, maybe Sandy, do you want to talk a little bit about what happens if there's a capability at a facility that um, isn't that you wanted to use and and um, you wanted to reach out? I know, for example, that Texas ended up. Um, accepting an experiment that wanted to look at two omega conversion of the Texas petawatt. So what did that process look like? Is that a question that the user asked you and then you had that discussion with Kramer or how did how did that come about that you guys were able to get that uh, assessed as being possible? Um, well, part of the, uh, the, the group, uh, you know, used to be part of the Texas petawatt. So that, you know, that was already a pretty close collaboration. Uh, that line of communication was open, but I think they they didn't formally open it um, except with the uh, the proposal review committee. Um, so, uh, but they all already had the base knowledge of of you know the size of our chambers and the capability of the the laser system and the wavefront and things like that. And they definitely would have. I would have really encouraged you know had it been anyone else basically uh, reaching out directly. To get that information uh, from us, because yeah, we're more than happy to, just as Jorge said, you know, to to have those discussions. Perfect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess um, I, this is kind of a time where we can talk a little bit about um, facility or platform development type experiments, right? So I know that I know that there haven't been too many of these um, in the last in the last cycles. Um, if a user team wants to do platform development, maybe Douglas, you can talk about a little bit about this. What, what, how do you still make a competitive or how, what kind of things would you suggest that users discuss with you or include in the proposal to kind of communicate that, that impact that maybe shorter focal length um, had at, at Ohio State? Okay, so there's two kinds of platform development. One is creating a new diagnostic for general use. Um, but I take it you mean uh, platform development where we enhance the capability of a facility. Yeah, I think specifically. I think because I think that that is something that has um, long term or kind of propagates forward, right? It's a new capability that more people will be able to use. Sure. And so the thing is that um, uh, these kinds of proposals are regarded well. Uh, there's There's certainly no bias against them. Uh, so, so the user just has to make the case that the uh, one of the things that stress is, is broader impacts. So is the facility platform improvement specific for a very niche niche experiment? Um, and, and if it's a great experiment, then, then, then maybe that's okay. But uh, if you can make the case that many users would want to use this, and that this will increase capability as time goes by, as for example, the long focal length uh, mode at um, CSU clearly does, then you've made a very strong case that by providing this capability, you're enhancing not only LaserNet US, but our entire community. Does that, uh, do you think that gets at it? Yeah, I think that definitely gets at it. And I think that kind of gives it as, because I think that that's a really important piece that's not always, not always straightforward in like how to phrase it and, and kind of show, right? Because a lot of these facilities take kind of on scientific case um, and trying to do crazy big ideas that sometimes the, the the platform development and things kind of fall by the wayside. That's a, um, that's a good point, but uh, yeah. I guess the thing to remember is that is that we're all not just physicists but laser physicists. Mm -hmm. and the only reason that we're all here is that we have implemented novel um, technologies into our own various laser systems. So. Um, if people have good ideas, uh, they, they should definitely write proposals on them. And again, yeah. by talking to the facilities, um, we might be able to help make suggestions. One of the strength, strengths, I think, of LaserNet US is that the facilities are not involved in proposal review. Mm -hmm. And so that means that we can more actively help 
um, and advise users, then we could have say we were uh, the reviewers ourselves, where our hands would be uh, 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 much more strongly tied. Francois, did you want to add something to that? Follow up with that? Yes, I do want to add something. Uh, so Doug mentioned that we will get a new Ethereum laser system that will be sub picosecond that will be scaled up to alpha joule in 2024. And we are looking for to have users that will come and use this Ethereum laser system to develop secondary sources. For example, terahertz sources, be and soft X-rays, um, laser wave electron acceleration at high repetition rate. So uh, we welcome users who are willing to build platforms on what we have such that those platforms can be used by other users of the network and generally uh, users of the facility. So this is greatly welcome to propose source development and platform development. Okay, um, does, just a reminder, you can drop your questions in the, the chat function there. We'll leave it open probably for a few more moments. Um, in case anybody has any less outstanding questions. All right, it looks like we've covered at least everything that's on your mind uh, for the time being. Um, I just want to remind you guys that the uh, proposal deadline is December 19th um, at 4 p.m. Pacific. If you have any questions about the process, about the proposals themselves, feel free to reach out to myself or Ariana Gleason, technical questions, the facility POCs, all of our contact information are on, um, on the LaserNet US website. Um, and Gillis? Hi, Chandra. Sorry to interrupt, but I just noticed that there was a question that landed underneath an answer to a question for MEC that was a question for JLF, and I'm not sure that we answered it. It was from Juan Gernandez. Which I think uh, is Gernandez. Yeah. Uh, and it says, for JLF, can you clarify the contrast level? Did we answer that question? We did not. No, I can take that. Um, so yes this is not something we have measured yet because the facility hasn't restarted so we won't have uh, a definite uh, measurements i don't think we'll have a definite measurement before the end of the uh, the, the proposal deadline um, however what i i can say is that uh, this is for the short pulse i'm guessing or for the long pulse it doesn't specify, but I would yeah. assume we're referring to the short pulse. So I'm going to, yeah, uh, 10 to the minus 7 is what we're expecting, uh, similar to ARC. Fantastic. Um, I guess that uh, that answers the question. Yeah. At least for the moment, yeah. Perfect. So um, with that, I will thank everyone that's still here uh, for attending today. Um, we will post this recording um, in the next couple of days on YouTube um, so that you can refer back to it um, if there's specific facility content that you're interested in reviewing. Um, and with that, I'll conclude and thank you all. Thank you, Doug.